Hello and welcome to Psyched, the show where we explore psychedelics through social, economic, and political perspectives. Our next speaker is Judy Bloomstock. Ms. Bloomstock brings over 25 years of experience in the life science sector, spanning from early to late stage investments. She is currently Executive Director of Corporate Development at TIAP, an early stage academic incubator in Toronto. In prior roles, Judith was a principal with Genesis Capital Partners, one of the largest Canadian venture firms focused on the life sciences industry. She was a partner with Royal Bank Capital Partners, Life Sciences Fund, and Director uh, of Biopharmaceutical Research at Drug Royalty Corporation. Judith received an MBA in Finance from Columbia Business School and a Bachelor's in Biology from the University of Toronto. Thank you for joining us, Judy, and welcome to Psyched. Hey, Mark, how are you? Great to be here. I'm gonna unblock myself. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Just give me one minute here. And um, whoops. Everybody see that okay? Um, yep, you're good. Just going to take you on a bit of a, a non linear um, talk this afternoon just to shake things up a little bit. So, I'm um, Judy Bloomstock, I'm the founder and CEO of Diamond Therapeutics. Um, the lineup for today is going to be a really short introduction on Diamond Therapeutics and then um, going to bookend the conversation with some reflection. So first I'm going to play you my favorite psychedelic song. Hopefully we don't have any failures of, of YouTube at this point. And um, then I'm going to walk you through some learnings on drug development for mental health. Um, and then bookend it again with just a couple of thoughts on mental health, just some things I've been pondering lately. So a bit of a meandering discussion this afternoon. So Diamond Therapeutics, we're developing safe, effective, non-hallucinogenic psilocybin-based drugs for the treatment of unmet neuropsychiatric conditions. That's Diamond. Um, like I said, I'm gonna keep it short. I'd like to make myself accessible. So if anybody wants to reach out and talk, I'm, I'm happy to chat about Diamond or anything else that's on your mind. Judy at diamondthera.com. So feel free to reach out to me. So my favorite song uh, that I guess you could put a psychedelic, psychedelic sort of title on is Cathedral by Crosby, Stills and Nash. This is a very old song. It goes back to 1997. It's been a source of inspiration for me. Um, and so I'm going to play you a couple of minutes of that. Maybe take some time to just reflect or listen, or if you don't like it, walk away for a minute, come back in a couple of minutes. Um, this song um, is about, to me, it's about the, the clarity, a moment of clarity that, um, that uh, was experienced by Graham Nash while he was in Winchester Cathedral on his 32nd birthday and he was on an acid trip at that time. And he had this moment of clarity. It happened to be about the place of religion in his life. Um, it's not an anti-religion song. It's really about his moment of clarity and you can see there, I wrote down the liner notes um, on the left-hand side of the screen if, if you want to read what he's thinking about when he's singing this song. But it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful song, my favorite psychedelic song. So I thought I'd play that for everybody for just for a few minutes. It's a, it's a long song. Judy, you might have to share um, the audio. Uh, so if you pause it real quick and then um, cancel the screen uh, screen sharing and when you click share screen again, there should be two boxes, two check boxes at the bottom of the screen. Okay, I see share screen. 
Yep. So click on share screen and then it'll show you all the different screens you can actually click. But before you click on one at the okay. bottom, there's two check boxes. Yep. Got it. Thank you so much. Yep. Oh, this might not work. It says that I have to reinstall Zoom audio. So well, maybe it's going to work. Let's see. You're good. pause there and uh, you get the idea but it's a it is a beautiful song and it really does speak to that moment of clarity that the psychedelics can provide so thought I just share that and um, and now I'll go back to some of the learnings um, after that a little bit of a segue so you know driving the psychedelic renaissance is a need for better approaches to treating mental health and we often decry the lack of good treatments for depression and other mental conditions. But as we diamond are going into, and I'm sure as a lot of people who are listening are going into, going into the drug discovery and drug development um, process, I thought it would be interesting to reflect on what an ideal drug would look like and what are the stumbling blocks in developing better therapies? What can we, what can we learn from past efforts? I'm sure you've seen some of these statistics before. 
about current therapeutics, just looking at the antidepressants alone, 25 to 30% of patients with major depressive disorder achieve remission with first line treatments with the SSRIs. But 30%, and I've even heard a statistic up to 50%, are treatment resistant, meaning there's not a good therapy for them or suboptimal. And what are we looking for? We're looking for better efficacy, obviously, a rapid onset, greater tolerability and safety, a reduction in relapse and recurrence of symptoms, and uh, no severe withdrawal effects. So again, as we're embarking upon our drug discovery platform, um, we're keeping in mind some of the challenges, and I thought I'd like to go through a few of these today. What are the challenges in drug development for neuropsychiatric conditions? First of all, there are um, complexities with neuropsychiatric conditions. Not everybody's illness is the same. The, the diseases are complex. They are sometimes hard to diagnose. They're often overgeneralized. There are issues with clinical trial design. It's sometimes restrictive as to who is included and excluded from the trials. We don't have a biomarker for depression or for obsessive compulsive disorder. So um, it, sometimes hard to address even what we're looking at. And then funding and initiatives for mental illness lag far behind those for, for other life-threatening diseases. On the last point, I was, digging for, I was digging for some information and I thought this chart was absolutely shocking. Um, on the last point of capital allocation for psychiatric conditions, you can see that psychiatric conditions have approximately three times greater prevalence than, than cancer. But in the period of time 2007 to 2016, they received one twelfth the amount of venture funding than cancer. It, it, it's, uh, that absolutely astonished me. And if you look at uh, a similar chart, but as relates to the direct healthcare costs in the US of psychiatric illnesses, there's almost a hundred million, 100 billion, sorry, billion dollar difference in the expenditures on psychiatric ailments versus cancer. And yet again, cancer received 12 billion versus approximately 1 billion in venture funding during that period 2007 to 2016. So a shocking differential there. One of the reasons for this is it's very hard to develop drugs in this sector. Um, if you look at the clinical success rate for major depressive disorder, versus drugs developed for all indications in the period 2006 to 2015, you can see that on the far right-hand side of the chart, going from phase one to approval for all drugs is an approximate 10% success rate, and for major depressive disorder, 5%. So it's, this is not an easy area. Recently, because, because of COVID, and I think because this has been recognized in the investment community, there has been money flowing to the sector in ways that we hadn't seen in the past. So if you look at the top chart there, which is from CB Insights, you can see that there was $576 million invested in mental health um, transactions in the first quarter of 2020, far greater than any previous quarter for the past many years. Uh, and financings in the psychedelic sector, of course, I mean, we're all involved with that. We know that that's, that's burgeoning and, and reached 150 million in, in 2020 year to date. So aside from, aside from the capital, which is, which is changing and we can feel hopeful about, there's, um, there's other issues with developing drugs in the sector. One is the heterogeneity of the conditions. For example, in depression, you know, my depression, your depression may be completely different. Um, a recent paper that I found identified over 1,000 unique symptom profiles in almost 4,000 patients. So for example, one patient may report sadness, concentration problems, weight loss, and so on. Another may not be able to sleep and may be gaining weight. So of course, when you're thinking about enrolling patients in a trial, when they are so different but, but fall under the same DSM-5 diagnosis, um, it may be very hard to figure out which drugs are effective for whom and, and, and how they're going to react in trials may be, may be, of course, understandably very different. Then there's something 
that we can call expectation bias or, or placebo effect, um, which is also something that has to be considered in, in designing these trials that we're about to embark on. For example, if you know as a patient going into a trial that there's a placebo arm and an active arm, you are about 10% less likely to respond to the active. And that's an expectation bias, of course, that comes from believing that you may be on placebo. Um, that's, um, that's, I thought, quite interesting and obviously something that needs to be really carefully reflected on when we're thinking about trials going forward. And then there's just compliance. I mean, are people taking the drugs that um, they're supposed to be taking, especially uh, important in, in the phase three drug trials where patients are often taking these drugs on their own at home. So for example, we saw a notable failure um, by Sage Therapeutics last December where they missed their primary endpoint in a double-blind placebo-controlled study. Um, when they looked at the results after the fact, they found that about one-tenth of the patients weren't taking the drug, so they weren't in compliance with the treatment regimen for the, for the trial. And so um, there was actually statistical significance achieved when those patients were included. So now SAGE has to go back and do some more trials and so on. So this, this becomes really important, and we have to think about how to, how to achieve better compliance. So just to wrap up on the learning part, I think um, we have an opportunity here with a spotlight on psychedelics as a starting point for drug therapies. Um, it's a turning point and an opportunity for funding for psychiatric drug development that we, that we really haven't seen for the past 10 years and uh, an opportunity to learn from past trials drawing on that learning. Um, I'd like to go back, as I mentioned, to just a moment of reflection that the statistics on mental illness are very sobering. Again, I'm sure you've seen many of these. 350 million um, people suffering from depression worldwide, 14 billion on antidepressants globally, 13% um, of Americans said so they took an antidepressant in the, in the last month. These are, these are heavy statistics. Uh, and mental health is something that affects us all. So with Diamond as a startup company, we're starting to turn our attention to how we can, how we can ameliorate this with small efforts, with those close to us, just small acts of kindness. Um, giving people the benefit of the doubt when we're interacting, especially in this day and age of COVID. Um, there are many stressors upon all of us. So the, the idea that mental health is everybody's issue it has never been truer. Uh, as a startup, we're trying to think about policies that we may put in place that really emphasize mental well-being for every employee and for all that we're encountering with the company. And of course, we're thinking about grander gestures that may be possible. Um, as the company evolves. And that's, that's the end of my prepared statement. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'm happy to discuss any and all of the above. Hey, Judy, thank you so much for coming on, for sharing your perspectives. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, that's an awesome song. I'm definitely going to, uh, you know, listen to the whole thing and check it out. Um, I like, I wish there was, it's a very particular type of music. Uh, I feel like this, um, a little bit more like melancholy type of like moving piece. Uh, and I wish there was, you know, is there like a genre that describes, uh, pieces that fall into, um, like a, a genre that that piece specifically falls into? Oh God, I don't know. I mean, that was early Crosby, Stills and Nash. Um, and I guess you could call that folk rock i mean they were folk rock okay they were very activist i mean they were very activist in their day um earlier on um and not all of their music um is psychedelic at all but that one particular song really struck me and i feel so fortunate because it's a song that's been sort of on my mind for so many years and last summer i was actually able to put my headset on and go into winchester cathedral and listen to it you know full blast mm. And it's a, it's a magical song. Like I said, it's, um, it's him grappling with some really important issues um, and, and coming to a moment of clarity, which I thought is, is really what it's all about, right? That's what we're, we're all seeking to do in our lives. 
Definitely, definitely. Um, I'd love for you to, uh, you know, just share some of your ideas and thoughts on, you know, you have this immense amount of experience in uh, kind of clinical uh, research, life sciences, all of the components that uh, help this ecosystem run in a more formal sense. Um, there's a lot of researchers that are looking for informal ways to be able to contribute, um, that are looking for, you know, how do we run uh, more research uh, that can help inform these things, but maybe not, you know, for the hundreds of millions of dollars that it requires. Typically, um, maybe allowing for individuals who are just interested in psychedelics to be contributing. So there's some microdosing research, things like that. Do you have, uh, you know, any ideas um, or thoughts on, you know, how kind of the average person can be contributing to the body of knowledge and research in this space? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, and, and Merrick, just to clarify, are you talking about researchers that might be interested in this space coming into it? Or are you talking but, about yeah, people who have a research background? I, I think even people who don't necessarily have a research background, you know, I get so many pings per day that are just like, you know, oh, you know, we've seen what you're doing. We see what companies in this space are doing. We really want to be involved. We want to help the research advance. We want to help build things. But I think I'm more specifically interested, you know, building a company is one thing, but contributing to the research is another. And I think we still need to contribute to the research a lot. So what are some of the things that we might be able to say to folks who don't have that, you know, traditional research experience, but are still looking to somehow push the field along? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you know, one obvious thing is that they can participate in clinical trials when those trials come online and be a research participant. I think that's really valid. I think from what I've seen, most of the people that are involved in this field are, are very open. And so, you know, reaching out to the companies that are just getting started like ourselves and talking about their interests um, and seeing if there's some alignment, something that they could do, some way to be involved, I think is you know, it's an opportune time as we see this industry. I mean, we can call it an industry now. I really call it a sector, but it is becoming an industry. Um, I think there are ways for people just to to reach out, see where their where their mindsets are aligned with the people that they're they're meeting, network, and uh, and and have those conversations. Mm -hmm. It's a very. Uh, I mean, on the research side, I can give some you know more pointed guidance. I mean, on the research side, of course, companies are, like ours are looking to do sponsored research programs and so if, of course if there are people who, are, who have some interesting ideas within the research community within the academic community i think we'd be interested in, in hearing those ideas and seeing whether we can make some funding available um, and help out with uh, with some of that some of that work mm, beautiful well thank you and um, you know, I really want to kind of bring it to this uh, point of, of clarity that um, you're speaking about in the, the song shared. You know, what are what do you feel like the psychedelics ecosystem right now is is fuzzy on? What are the places that we don't have clarity? And what do you feel like are the moments we should be expecting over the next five, 10 years that will actually provide some? Yeah, I mean, I think in any um, in any nascent sector, you're going to see a lot of this fuzziness at the beginning, right, where people are trying to figure out what the business models are, what works, what doesn't work, who should we align ourselves with, how much um, is okay in the business world, how much is not okay in the business world. And I think we're all trying to, you know, to jockey around the, some of those ideas and, and sort it out in a meaningful way and, and hopefully in a really collaborative way. Um, so you know, this is, this is just what happens at the, at the beginning of, of, of a sector's growth, I think. And, you know, looking forward, I think, um, I've made this comment before, I think it might look nothing like what it looks like now. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that whatever our visions are and the good parts of our vision, we, we take that forward and we drive that forward. Um, we saw with, you know, what happened with the dot-com bubble and, and the companies that were the high flyers at that point, um, not surviving business models did work, didn't work. I mean, mergers. And I mean, I think we're going to see all of that going forward. And I think we have to be very, very open-minded as to, as to what success looks like here. I think being, being part of it at the beginning is part of the success. And I, I really mm -hmm. believe that. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, I think um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, 10 years from now when we're no longer at the beginning, when things have developed, uh, what are some thoughts on what the ecosystem might look like just, you know, having seen life sciences sectors uh, evolve before? Where do you think we'll be 10 years from now in regards to this specific sector? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see some successes. I'm really hopeful about the successes we're going to see. I think we're going to see some changing attitudes towards psychedelics where, um, 
you know, certainly for my generation, that was a big dirty word to even think about psychedelics. That was a big no-no. Um, and so I think we'll see fantastic change in, in, in attitude. I mean, we're seeing that ourselves in our small circles, but if you go a bit more broadly, I'm not sure that that's really very well understood. Um, so I think there's some work to be done there. Um, I think we will see clinics, clinics thriving and, and drugs, you know, go making their way through the, through the clinic that offer, uh, offer real benefit for patients. So again, it's, it, it's exciting to be part of the beginning um, and uh, uh, the beginning of, of the sector in terms of its commercial, I think, and, and broader outreach. Of course, the sector has been there underground um, in the research labs. Um, for a good long time. So it's, it's, I'm sure for those people who have been involved for a long time, it's wonderful. Uh, it's mm -hmm. wonderful to see that. I, I personally have been thinking about this since, uh, as you know, Merrick, I've told you my stories. I've been thinking about this since 1997 myself, um, tried to start Diamond Therapeutics in 2007. So it's absolutely amazing to see the transformation in, in attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, earlier today, um, you know, Ronan uh, from Field Trip mentioned that you were actually one of the first few people who uh, turned him and his crew onto psychedelics and then made them aware that this was even something. Um, where did you find that insight? Uh, you know, I, I've, I've heard a little bit about the story, but I'm sure our audience would uh, as well and kind of how you were ahead of the curb and, and knew um, that this might be something to really be paying attention to. Yeah, you know, it probably has, it probably has a little bit to do with my age. So I'm a little bit young to have gone through the Woodstock hippie era. But um, I was a precocious child and I was aware that it was going on. Um, I come from a university family and so on. And so I think it's always been in the back of my mind that people were having a good time at that time. And there were these LSD studies that were going on and then all of it came to a crashing halt. And so it's been really a, a point of a deep interest for me ever since, ever since childhood. Um, of course, I read, um, you know, the papers coming out from Roland Griffith's lab early on, there were some big headlines. One of his early papers got, uh, got the moniker, uh, the God pill in The Economist. And so it's been a, a, just, a, just a point, like I say, a, port, a point of real curiosity and interest for me for, for almost my whole life. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, one of the things that you know I've uh, I've really wanted to ask um, parents throughout this conference, but haven't gotten the chance to, is you know how do you uh, you know for, from my perspective, I'm building this uh, you know startup, and I don't have kids, but I have parents that I have to engage with about the fact that I'm building a psychedelic startup. How do you engage with your children about um, you know building a psychedelic startup? What does that language and conversation look like? Well, first of all, it means I'm really busy <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Um, in ways that are, are hard to describe to a kid, um, I guess. Um, but I think there's a, a growing understanding of that. Um, the psychedelic part, I mean, I try, um, I try not to sort of swing. Uh, so my daughter's a teenager, so um, she's going to do what she's going to do. But I try not to um, sway her too much one, in one direction or another. I try to be really neutral about it and, and talk about the fact that as I said in the top, we need better, you know, we, we need better treatments. Um, those treatments may come in the form of drugs, they may come in, in the form of neuromodulation, they may come in the form of, um, one of our advisors likes to say, you know, maybe somebody's hand on your elbow is all you need. Um, so the, the treatments come in, in many forms and, and I try to keep it on that level that, you know, we're trying to come up with something better here and uh, we're doing it very carefully and uh, it's, it's, drug development, it's, it's the development for, for Diamond, it's the development of a therapeutic. And the psychedelic aspect of it is, is a little bit to the side in those conversations. Mm -hmm, definitely. You know, one of the other questions I have um, is, there are so many folks who are psychedelics naive in my world, and I think in, in the worlds of many kind of, uh, of the entrepreneurs in this space right now. Um, you know, there's the kind of traditional psychonauts and activists and researchers who've been around the space for a long time and have surrounded themselves with, you know, folks who are really deeply ingrained in the psychedelic movement. I don't think that that's the case for a lot of the folks, especially who spoke today. Um, you know, and I'm wondering when, when individuals come to us to ask us about, uh, you know, psychedelic therapies, um, you know, psychedelic compounds, 
what has your, been your approach in regards to kind of introducing, um, introducing it to folks, especially folks who might be coming to you to, you know, try and um, seek out a suggestion of whether it's something that's right for them? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I just can't give them advice on whether it's right for them or not. I just don't feel that I, that's my spot or I'm qualified to do so. Um, I think in general, what I say is, look, um, and similar to comments that have been made, I think, um, I think just prior, the speaker just prior, that, you know, we're taking penicillin. It comes from a mushroom fungus as well. Um, there's, uh, I think, up to 25% of all the drugs we take that we think of as standard pharmaceuticals are plant-derived originally. Um, and so um, I urge them to be open-minded that this is another source of, of medication. We haven't had a lot of success um, with development of psychiatric drugs. We need to do better, and there's real promise here. So um, I think for those who aren't in the, in the thick of it on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it does require them to be open-minded, but I think when they hear those types of arguments, it's, it's hard to argue. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, Judy, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time, your music, and everything you brought. Um, and uh, we'll be chatting offline soon. Thanks a million, Merrick. See you soon. Bye-bye.